Um, good evening, everyone, or good day, or whatever time of the day is you watch this. Good that time of the day. Uh, welcome. Today's going to be our first lecture. It's going to be, uh, you know, sort of an introductory one. Um, you know, this tends to be long. It's more of less of a, here's a bunch of stuff to remember, should we pass it on? It's more so just like, a, hey, here's all the microbiology stuff. Here's some cool stuff about microbes. Here's the sort of the foundations of the course. Um, so it's going to be history, microbial groups, and structure. So we're going to talk about them. Uh, there are three different topics, the first of which is, again, less so important for exams. Uh, the next one is getting a little bit more important. And then finally, the last one, the structure part, is going to be very, very important. So if you're watching this, this would be, uh, you know, if we were in class together, it would be on September 1st, 2020. So uh, just as a reminder, if you need to contact me, the best way is always by email. Um, but again, I also put my cell phone number as well as um, we have the capacity on the syllabus as well as the capacity to chat via Zoom or Skype or you know, Google Chats or any of the number of bajillion texting, talking things out there. Um, so if, again, if you ever have any questions about anything, please just reach out. There's no reason to struggle in the dark. No reason to um, you know uh, be struggling on anything. Um, like, just reach out to me. Evan can get you thing, get you all situated really fast. So. Question we should ask ourselves, and the question you probably asked yourselves um, if you didn't have to take this course because it was required, is why should you study microbes? And the sort of the, 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 the most common answer I get um, when I ask this question, whether it's to a microbiology class or it's to a general biology class, is that they do terrible things. These terrible things can be something like, um, like Clostridium tetani, so this is a cause of, cause of agent of tetanus. Uh, something like uh, smallpox virus causing smallpox infection, or something um, such as uh, dysentery, which is causing all sorts of nasty side effects in our European folk down here. So microbes can do some really terrible things. And this is the sort of the rap, the bad rap, I would argue, that microorganisms get. And I think it's easy to say that microbes are doing bad things, especially when we have a pandemic um, sort of kicking, it, kicking and screaming going right now. But um, they do do some terrible things, but I hope I'm going to convince you by the end of the class that they do some great things. And, you know, you can think about something like mozzarella on pizza, microbes all the way are making that. So they do some pretty amazing things. In addition, they also make some pepperonis as well. So microbes are doing some pretty amazing things for you. So there's some good, some bad. And again, I hope I can convince you through, throughout this course that they're doing a lot of good as opposed to doing a lot of bad. Um, microbes are also um, responsible for some beautiful sites such as this. So if you haven't seen this picture before or a similar picture, this, this is the White Cliffs of Dover, England. And these are just bunches of microorganisms. You might think they're rock, but they're actually a bunch of microscopic, what are called diatoms or coccolithophores, stacked on top of each other. And they have these hard outer shells that make them very much rock-like. But beautiful signs like this, again, it's all because of microscopic organisms. And these microorganisms are also producing tons and tons of oxygen when they are, in fact, alive. Um, in addition, microbes make up the vast majority of life. So this is a really sort of crazy-looking phylogenetic tree. And it's got all these bacteria and archaea here. Um, and then you have our eukaryotes here at the bottom. And you know, humans and all the things we think of that are big sort of fall into this broad category of eukaryotes. And you'll notice that of this very, very large phylogenetic tree, those eukaryotes, including humans, make up a very small section. And microbes, as you will soon find out, are the most diverse, the most abundant organisms on this planet. So it's really important to understand this massive tree of life and all the stuff that's happening over here and with our archaea down here, as opposed to thinking, you know, this is the most important part. But when we're thinking about microbiology as a whole, it falls into two main categories. We have the basic, which is with, with the sort of basics of you know, anything where you have taxonomy, physiology, genetics, and ecology. And then we have the applied, which we're trying to use microbiology to answer practical problems. This includes diseases, water quality, food and industrial microbiology. But at the end of the day, you can't study basic microbiology without some sort of overlying context of applied biology and vice versa. You can't really have applied bi microbiology without the basic microbiology. So they're interrelated, and we as a class are going to cover them together. So what is microbiology as a whole? Well, it's the study of organisms too small to be clearly seen with an unaided eye. And so this is what we call microorganisms. And there's a wide sort of range of size of these microorganisms. So this it ranges from the very large. So we have Pelomyca, which is an amoeba, or it's basically a protist that eats bacteria. It's five millimeters long. Um, five millimeters, just in case you didn't know, is 
is um, pretty, it's about half a centimeter. So it's, you know, about one eighth of an inch. So it's visible with the eye, but it's still considered a microorganism. And then we have the very, very small varicella. This is a virus, it's about 100 nanometers. This is also about the size of the COVID-19 virus. Um, very, very small, 100 nanometers. We have, you know, a very huge range of sizes of microbes. And so they can be very, very small, or they can be relatively large. Now, as I mentioned, there's a very large range of microbes and it varies by several orders of magnitude. So in the table below, um, basically I showed you the varicella virus and the amoeba. The amoeba is 10,000 times larger than the virus. And just to put that in perspective of how much of a scale difference that is, that might not seem like a lot, but um, 10,000 times is, is a huge number on terms of size. So if we scaled up a virus to the size of a mouse, how big would the amoeba be? And the, the answer to this question might surprise you. So if this, is our, if this is our virus here, and our amoeba is 10,000 times larger. How big would this amoeba be? Well, if you do the math, which I did, the amoeba ends up being about the size of the prudential center. So that's 10,000 times, which I think is sort of a crazy way to think of it, right? Classifying these microorganisms in this very, very broad category, and the size difference is enormous. It is absolutely enormous. Again, mouse to the prudential center. So microbe sizes are very cool, but size as a whole might just seem like a, you know, like a fun thing, right? Oh, 10,000 times. It's actually something that's really, really, really important. Size is a huge factor in biology, depending how big you are, how small you are. It affects all sorts of basic biological questions, including how fast you can reproduce, how much you can take in for energy, how much energy you can produce, uh, how, you're, how likely you are to be preyed upon or be a predator. And it affects all functioning from the very, very small to the very, very high levels of the function of any organism. And that's true for humans as well. Smaller people, while we have similar functions as say larger people, um, we do function differently at um, sort of different scales. So size really, really matters. And a microbe size, as we'll discuss later in this course, will be a huge advantage uh, for them in many aspects. So small is good for being a pathogen. Uh, small is not so good when you're being eaten. Um, but I guess to mention, it's, there's goods and bads to the sizes of microbes. So when we're thinking about sort of the cutoffs for a microbe size, it's typically about 0.1 millimeter. This is what we generally consider the cutoff for a microbe. And there are some... Uh, Exceptions to this rule, um, so for instance, Thiam margarita uh, nambiensis, which is uh, the sulfur pearl of Nambia. Um, this is what it looks like under the microscope. It is the largest bacteria currently known to science. Um, it's a microbe that actually uses sulfur to generate its energy. So instead of using oxygen, it uses sulfur. And it can grow to the size of the head of a fruit fly. And so this is clearly not a, you know, I'm sure you guys have all seen fruit fruit fly flying around your garbage or something like that at some point, this microbe can be about the size of the head of a fruit fly, which is visible, right? Something visible with your naked eye, but it is a bacteria. And so microbes as a whole, um, you'll see that there's lots of exceptions for microbes throughout this course, but typically microbes are only microscopic as a whole. And so this is the size covariance. We have uh, our sulfur pearl, and then we have the fruit fly. Head. So the, it's a big, 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 big boy. Um, and so when we're thinking about this, microbes that are, organisms that are microbe sized include most unicellular organisms. This includes bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And as I mentioned, there are some macroscopic unicellular organisms, um, like the ones that you physically can see with your eye. And these, clue are, these include our sulfur pearl, which we just talked about, um, Calupera taxifolia and Valonia ventricosa are both algae. And these are just one giant cell. <laughs> Um, I know these look big and they, and they are big. You can see the human hand here for size comparison. This is just one big cell. So it's one giant cell. This is just one giant cell that makes up this organism. Um, so just because you're, you know, you're, you can be very, very large doesn't mean you are, don't, doesn't mean you have to be multicellular. You can be large and be single cellular. Um, but again, most microorganisms are single cellular or unicellular. And there are many, many types of microorganisms that are multicellular. These include our eukaryotic organisms, including fungi, algae, and well, microanimals, so dust mites, rotifers, copepods. 
Uh, if, you want, if you want to ruin your day one day, uh, take a peek at uh, what dust mites look like under a microscope or look at uh, eyelash mites under a microscope. It's a really fun way to ruin your day and to see how dirty your house and your skin are. Just as a, just as a note, like I said, unless you want to ruin your day, don't Google what I told you to, just Google. Now, let's move away from size. You know, again, typical size is 0.1 millimeters, generally single study organs. That's really what we're going to be focusing on here because there's a huge, but as I mentioned, there's a huge number of size anomalies here, right? And we can think about different types of definitions of how to, what do we consider to be the field of microbiology? And so typically when the most common things we say when we're saying, oh, I'm a microbiologist, and so when we compare them to large organisms, microbes are very simple in construction, lack high, highly differentiated cells and distinct tissues. And that's the sort of the most common way you see it, and, and that sort of gets around all the, the sort of issues of size and multicellularity that I've mentioned. Um, but for the purposes of the course, microbes will include bacteria and archaea, and we'll talk about those two groups very shortly, and then some eukaryotes, and we're thinking about some eukaryotes such as algae, fungi, and protists, and then we'll be talking about viruses as well. So this is our definition. This is our working definition. That little exercise we went to is just to show you that the field of microbiology is, is kind of a kind of a mess at times. Uh, it's kind of a hard thing to see. So what are some major features of microorganisms? So as we mentioned, they're very smaller, very rarely can be seen with the naked eye. They have very, very simple construction, and that's at a uh, cellular level. So that's in contrast to your own cells. They have a very, very simple cellular structure. Uh, one of the coolest things microbes do is they evolve extremely rapidly. And so uh, microevolution, in a general sense, is very quick. And so this is typically due to their size and their life history. So microbes typically have a quick generation time. They may have very small, less compact genomes, and they have less, less developed DNA repair machinery. These, all these things should ring a bell from your sort of your first biology courses at, at RCC. Um, and this idea all plays into microbes evolving fast. Um, we're going to talk about microbial evolution a little bit later in the course, um, talk about some cool examples, but just keep these in the back of your mind until then. They evolve fast. And that's important, um, you know, when we're thinking about infections. It's important when we're thinking about how COVID has changed as a jump from animal to human, right? That evolutionary aspect happened quick. And that's an important thing to think of. And again, one we'll discuss later this semester. Um, and this does form all sorts of cool, this idea of fast evolution forms all sorts of cool topics we'll discuss, including antibiotic resistance, symbiosis, and cell signaling. And just to show you, sort of show you how fast microorganisms can evolve, this is a really, uh, really nice figure I like to use a lot. And so we have the number of unique enzymes here on the y-axis, and then we have the year in the x-axis, so we have 1970 to 2015. Now, this is uh, beta-lactamase, our class of enzymes. And these, are, these help uh, microorganisms detoxify from antibiotics. In particular, they, they target psyllin, so penicillin, amoxicillin, those sort of class of antibiotics. There's, there's a bunch of them. Um, but what you'll notice is that when we sort of started looking at this in the 70s, we had a very few number of beta-lactamases. So again, these are enzymes that are involved with antibiotic resistance. And as you notice that through the years, in 20 years, we go from almost zero up to 100, and then from 1990 all the way up to 2010, so again, 20 years, we essentially increase the number by nine times. And this couldn't happen if microorganisms didn't evolve rapidly. To see this level of evolution in a human would take millions of years. So it's a really, really small uh, time frame on the microbes, but again, a lot of evolution in history when you're dividing really fast. Um, another major feature of our microbes is they're metabolically diverse. And so as we'll talk about later in the semester, and you're probably going to hate this class, but I love it um, just as a note, but you're probably going to hate it. Uh, microbes have a very, very cool repertoire of metabolic diversity. Um, and when we think about um, what sort of humans are doing, what eukaryotes are doing, um, we're typically thinking about combining a sugar or a fat or a protein with oxygen to generate energy. So you're thinking about cellular respiration. Now, microbes you can use a wide range of substrates, a wide range of electron acceptors in place of oxygen, and they can all do all sorts of crazy and wacky and wild metabolisms that we'll discuss. But microbes have um, very, very diverse metabolisms, while us and other eukaryotes have very, very limited metabolisms. And, um, you know, we can just sort of look at a very sort of crazy map here, and we have respiration and photosynthesis. You can see all these different substrates and, and different intermediates that these microbes can use in their metabolism. But again, us as humans and most eukaryotes, oxygen and sugar. That's it. Microbes, 
Not so much. They're doing all sorts of crazy, wacky, wild things. And as we'll discuss later in the semester, they do form the basis for how ecosystems function. So they cycle nutrients through ecosystems. Um, microorganisms are also what we call taxonomically diverse. And what do I mean by this? Well, taxonomically means there's just a huge number of species out there. So currently there's depending on who you ask, about 2 million species of macroscopic, so very large things, described on this planet. There's estimated to be about 6 to 8 million, but right now there's about 2 million described. Um, that's in direct contrast to the estimated 100 million bacterial and archaeal species that are on this planet. So microbes are, they have 10 times the amount of species level diversity than eukaryotes do. And this is an important thing. As we'll talk about later in the semester, microbes were the very first organisms on this planet. They've been evolving for a very, very long time. And all this diversity allows them to do a couple different things. So it allows them to derive new solutions to environmental issues such as pollution or antibiotics. It allows us to tap into new industrial processes. So you probably didn't know this, but a lot of the things that you um, consume on an everyday basis, whether it's in food or maybe it's something like toothpaste or a cosmetic, anything like that, it probably has some roots in a microbial uh, product. Um, they can also be potential drug candidates and potential for new strategies for utilizing microbes to improve agriculture, um, whether that's of plants or animals. So all this diversity is meaningful. It has direct applications to what humans are using. And the other sort of aspect is microbes are everywhere. They, as I mentioned, they are the most diverse organisms on the planet, but they are also the most abundant life forms on this planet. There's approximately 10 to the 30 bacteria and archaea on this planet. 10 to the 30. Just to put that in perspective, what does 10 to the 30 mean? Well, you as a human have about 10 to the 12 cells in your body, right? You're a fully grown human, say you weigh 150 pounds, you have about 10 to the 12 or 30 trillion cells in your body. The amount of microbes relative to the amount of cells in your body is 20 times that. It is a, I'm sorry, 20 orders of magnitude higher. It is enormous, 10 to the 30 microbes is a massive number. Um, so just to put this in a little bit more perspective, uh, there's about 10, for every glass of water you drink, there's about 10 to the six microbes per milliliter. Every soil, gram of soil you've ever seen has about 10 to the nine microbes. And there's about 10 to the seven microbes per square inch of your skin. And that doesn't matter where you're from in the world, you have tons of microbes. Um, microbes represent about an equal amount of biomass, so living tissue as plants on this planet. And, and they significantly um, outnumber the mass of animals as well as humans on this planet. So they are really, really heavy as well. And they are everywhere. So they live kilometers below the, the crust in the crust of the earth. They live very deep underwater. They live at boiling temperatures and they live on and in all of us. So we exist with our microorganisms inside of our body and on our skin. We live in about a one to one or a one to 10 ratio, um, depending on what you call a cell. And we'll talk about this um, idea of microbes living on and inside you later in the semester when we cover the human microbiome. But um, the sort of the sort of the interesting thing about microbes, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, that there's 10 to the 30 of them. Um, one of the interesting things about microorganisms is they, uh, it's only really a recent discovery. Um, micro, the field of microbiology really only dates back about a couple hundred years. And this is really in direct contrast to say the field of biology, which dates back for hundreds and thousands of years. So microbiology as a field is relatively new. Um, and we're going, to do, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the history is of microbiology as a whole, because I think it's a kind of a cool thing to think about, because we're going to be talking about all this brand new, fancy microbiology. Um, but microbiology as a field um, essentially didn't exist, again, until about the 1700s. Um, but the kind of the cool thing about microbiology, even though as a scientific discipline it didn't exist, we've been using microbes for generations, for thousands of years. And so microbes have been in our food, uh, they've been making a stick. Um, they've been making our food for essentially since humans came to be. So microbes, um, in terms of using them to make food, there's evidence of primitive beer making um, in Israel from about 13,000 years ago. So that's a really long time ago. <laughs> really long time, right? 11,000 BC. Uh, wine making as a process dates back to 6,000 BC, and uh, we do know that there's per we do know that in Babylon in Egypt about 3,000 BC. We do know that there is purposeful um, making of alcoholic beverages like spirits and things like that. So um, 
Microbes, uh, like I said, microbiology is a field new. My, humans using microbes to make awesome things like yogurt or cheese or beer or wine, very, very old. But again, very, very new field scientifically. And it really started with uh, this gentleman, Robert Hooke. He's an English scientist. Um, and he uh, essentially popularized the use of a microscope. Um, and so he published this book in 1665 uh, called Micrographia. And he, he coined the term cells. And now this is a sort of a term we use in all of biology, a cell, that sort of basic unit of life. Uh, but it was coined in the 1660s by Robert Hooke. Now, Robert Hooke, he was credited with inventing the microscope, but uh, the really uh, discovery of microorganisms um, as a sort of a beginning of a field really started with Antony von Leeuwenhoek. And so he was alive between 1632 and 1723, so almost 100 years. Um, he was a Dutch businessman and a scientist, and he was actually the very first person to accurately observe and describe single-celled microorganisms, so bacteria. And he termed these creatures animacules. You might have heard that term um, before at some point. Um, and he did all sorts of cool experiments with his microorganisms. And so his microscopes were very, very simple, but relative um, to previous, such as Robert Hooke's microscope, they were very, very advanced. So Lewin Hooke's microscopes were single, were single lens, and this is very much how, much his, how his microscopes would look. Very, very, very simple. So he put his microbes on the specimen hold here is basically a needle, then he would have his lens and he would just look through it like this person here is in this picture. Now, the thing of that uh, Lewin Hook did is um, he, made the, he made perfectly spherical glass lenses. That was his major breakthrough. And if you don't know anything about microscopes, don't rack your brain of saying, why does that matter? Just know that it does. Making perfectly spherical lenses really makes a difference when you're trying to observe things. And so when we had um, our friend Robert Hook looking at things, he was magnifying things at like maybe five times or 10 times what you would see with your naked eye. But Lewin Hook's microscopes could, could magnify things at 50 to 300 times. And as we'll talk about, um, these, this sort of this, microbes are very, very small. Um, and if you can't amplify your sample uh, visually this many times, you simply won't be able to see most microorganisms. Now, after Hook and Lewin Hook, microbiology actually took about 200 years to take off. Um, and you might say, well, why? Why, if, if Lewin Hook made these cool lenses, um, why wasn't everyone looking at microbes everywhere? Well, Lewin Hook was a very proud and super paranoid individual. And he, he basically kept this secret um, to himself for generations. Uh, he just did not want to give the secrets of his microscopes away to people. So he actually single-handedly, in a uh, typical jerk scientist fashion, actually single-handedly stalled the field of microbiology <laughs> um, for a couple hundred years simply because he uh, didn't want to share his microscopes. But eventually people uh, figured out his tricks and they started making microscopes, but it did, again, it took a couple hundred years. I can only imagine how advanced the field of microbiology would be if Lunuk wasn't such a jerk and hoarded all of his things. Um, and so the, the way Lewin Hook and, 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 um, and Hook were himself studying microorganisms by physically observing them, but um, later microbiology was thinking about how to isolate or culture microorganisms. And this again, didn't, didn't really quite happen for a bit, right? It was about 200 years between Lewin Hook and Robert Koch. And Robert Koch um, is a famous a microbiologist. He's got a sweet mustache, as I, I feel like most people in that time had way sweeter mustaches than they do now. Um, but he was a microbiologist working, doing his thing in the 1840s, and he's famous for what are called Koch's postulates. And these are these essentially is a post set of postulates that we use to identify the causative agents of microorganisms. And he's really well known for characterizing tuber the microbes that cause tuberculosis, cholera, as well as anthrax. Now, what does Koch's postulates do? Well, the idea being, if you have a diseased animal, you, ice you isolate a suspected microorganism on a Petri dish. Um, if we were in person doing this in, in a lab, you would see this. Um, once you culture your microorganism, you have to then uh, essentially give it to another organism to essentially show that this organism caused the disease. And then if you give that organism a disease based on giving them this microorganism, then you reculture it and you basically can say, well, I have this, dis this diseased organism. I got this microbe. I gave it to another organism. It got sick. And then I re-isolated that microbe. Thus, you can conclude based on Koch's postulates here 
that microorgan that microorganism is the causative agent of that disease. And that's that was sort of his big thing. The set of postulates that allow you to say anthrax causes anthrax, cholera causes cholera, tuberculosis causes tuberculosis. And this is what we all owe to Robert Koch. Now, again, he was all doing this all based upon culturing organisms or growing them on a petri dish. And so as we mentioned, um, Robert Koch is famous for his postulates, um, but he actually had some really important um, uh, assistants. So we had Julius Petri, who invented the petri dish or or Petri dish, which is a, a glass or plastic dish that you would be using in the lab with me if we were meeting in person. And then he also um, had Wal Walther Hess, he, which suggested using agar as a growth medium. Um, actually, there's some evidence suggests that it was actually his wife's idea, but he gets the credit for it. And so if we were working together in lab, which unfortunately we're not this semester, um, we would owe pretty much all that we know to these two people, growing microbes on a dish and on agar, that's what you do in lab as a microbiologist. You, you grow microorganisms and we owe it all to Koch's assistance. So after Robert Koch, uh, we moved in what's called the golden age of microbiology. And this was 1850s to the 1940s. And the first major player here was actually Louis Pasteur. And he invented this process called pasteurization. Now, whether or not you know it, um, you owe a lot of food safety, whether it's milk or cheese or juices to Louis Pasteur. Now, pasteurization is a really important process. Um, basically, what pasteurization does is you heat anything up to a, a just below or just over the boiling point of water. And what that does is sterilize your organism, your, your thing. So you can have something like apple juice, you pasteurize it, again, heat it to a very high temperature to kill the microorganisms. Thus, it becomes safe, safe or safer for consumption. And that's what Pasteur is really known for. But he also helped develop the first vaccines to chickenpox. Um, I'm sorry, chicken cholera. I saw chicken and I was thinking chickenpox. Uh, anthrax and rabies. And he also um, coined the term fermentation. So if you guys like beer or wine or cheeses, you, or maybe something like kombucha or sauerkraut, you owe a lot to uh, Louis Pasteur for coining fermentation. And he also provided evidence against the spontaneous generation and as well as the germ theory of disease. So you, you all have heard of microbes being called disease, uh, disease causing disease being called germs. Um, he's the guy that coined that term. And he basically showed that, uh, that it wasn't just like bad air that caused disease or random things. It was actually microorganisms that caused disease. Um, next up was Joseph Lister. Um, and you might recognize his name. Um, and because uh, you might have used Listerine, and Listerine was actually named after Joseph Lister. And so he's actually considered the modern, uh, the father of modern surgery, and he was the pioneer of aseptic surgery. And when we say aseptic surgery, it means doing surgery with keeping your mind on microorganisms. So cutting someone open and trying not to get them getting an infection. That's what he really pioneered. Um, and so that was Joseph Lister. Um, he has a, net, a generous... A, I'm sorry, a genus of bacteria named after him. And as I mentioned, he also has Listerine named after them. Uh, moving into the 1900s, we have Alexander Fleming, and he isolated the first antibiotic. And you probably have heard the stories before, but it's penicillin. I'm sorry, penicillin. And it's from the, the, the fungus or the mold, penicillium notatum. Um, it, he discovered this in, in, in 1928, and the classic story for how he discovered this is he had a petri dish of a bacteria, and he left it open on, over the weekend. And when he came back, he found a mold growing on his petri dish. And what he did notice is that wherever the mold was growing, this penicillium notatum, the bacteria would not grow. So he said, well, why is that the case? Well, he did a bunch of science and figured out it was actually producing an antibiotic or penicillin. And once he discovered that in the, in the late 20s, it was clinically deployed about, you know, uh, two decades later or so, uh, ushering in the area of, era of antibiotics, which is, again, a really important thing. But again, as you notice, this is a, an error. It's a big, important thing given to us by microorganisms. Um, so that's the golden age. All sorts of cool things discovered, antibiotics, things like that. Modern microbiology is the 1950s through now. So this is led by molecular discoveries, looking at the structure of DNA, recombinant DNA methods, DNA sequencing. And these things have transformed microbiology from just culturing or micros microscopy to um, all sorts of crazy things we can learn by looking at the genetics and the cellular structures of organisms. 
So for instance, in the 80s, um, <clears throat> uh, Fred Sanger inserted a gene um, into a bacteria called E. coli or Escherichia coli to produce uh, hormone uh, insulin for diabetics. That was in the 80s. Um, in the 1990s, we used ribosomal RNA gene sequencing from, and Carl Woese discovered that archaea are a different and unique subset of bacteria from, uh, our, I'm sorry, a subset of microorganisms from bacteria. Um, and he, this essentially gave us the three domain system in the 90s. Um, we have Steve Giovanni um, discovered a bacteria called SAR11, which is the most abundant organism on the planet. Um, it, co it constitutes about 25% of all cells on the planet. So the 1990s was a big time. And then finally, in the 2000s, we had the human and earth microbiome projects. And these are two projects we'll talk about later in this lecture. But that's sort of the history of microbes. We're, you know, we're at this point where we're using all sorts of cool technology to understand microbes. And so we're going to talk about all these things. But what's the future of microbes? And the beautiful thing about every science is there's lots of challenges and opportunities. And these include both human, animal, and plant genomics, uh, emerging infectious diseases such as Ebola, SARS, Zika, COVID-19, um, new and improved industrial processes, and a really huge classifying of all this diverse microbial diversity in ecology on this planet. So let's uh, summarize this first part of the lecture, the history part. So microbes have very few divining features. They're small, simple, diverse, and everywhere. But as we discussed, there are many, many exceptions to this rule. Uh, microorganisms and their study of them has a very rich history. Humans have used microbes for thousands of years. Microbiology itself as a science really only dates back to the 1600s with Hook and Leeuwenhoek. Um, and after a hundred year lull, microbiology did surge forward to the turn of the century. And microbiology, um, as I could tell you at great length, has a huge amount of, of sort of discoveries currently happening and hap going to happen in the future. So microbiology as a science has a very, very bright future. I mean, that's, that's, that's true for every science too. Um, I can't say microbiology is alone there, but it does have a very, very bright uh, future, which I think is cool. You're going to learn all sorts of cool things throughout this semester um, that you've probably never heard of before. And those, those things you're going to learn uh, now are going to be even crazier than if you took this class in 10 years. So stay tuned to the news uh, and see all the cool things microbes are going to do for us growing forward. So it's part one. Um, as I mentioned, this is a three-part lecture. So um, this would be basically like if we had three one-hour courses all jammed at one time. So that's unfortunately the way this works. So next up, after history, we're going to have microbial groups. So what are the major groups of microbes and what are their main distinguishing characteristics? So um, we can sort of look at a, a microscope picture of microbes. We have microbes here, um, all the nice pretty colors. And then we have food particles here in, in, in gross sort of brown color. So our microbes, again, are small. But you notice they take a very limited number of shapes here. And they, again, relative to food, are pretty dang small. And so microbes have, are grouped into three major evolutionary groups. We have the bacteria, we have the archaea, and we have the eukaryotes. And then there's the fourth group that are the viruses that we have no idea what the heck is going on in terms of taxonomy. But um, just as a note, we're going to be discussing the viruses as well. And so at some point in evolutionary time, you know, one and a half billion to three and a half billion years ago, it depends on who you ask, there was some sort of common ancestor that gave rise to our bacteria, our archaea, and our eukaryotes. And our eukaryotes, again, when we're, for the purpose of this class, we're thinking mostly of algae, fungi, and protists. Um, and so our three groups of, of microbes, um, we have our bacteria up here. So this is our crazy tree that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. We have our bacteria up here our archaea up here, and down at the bottom we have our eukaryotes. So um, the main, the, sort of the thing you should take away from this is twofold. First is that archaea are more closely related to eukaryotes, that we know. Um, they share a much more closer evolutionary uh, ancestor than archaea due to bacteria, or archaea, I'm sorry, or bacteria due to eukaryotes. Um, and our bacteria are super duper diverse. So relative to archaea, relative to eukaryotes, most of life's diversity is in our bacteria. Now, that's um, the, the major phylogenetic groups, but there are major morphological groups that we have to talk about. Um, and so, as I mentioned, our archaea are most closely related to our eukarya. But um, people, in the his historically speaking, um, have grouped bacteria and archaea together. In fact, archaea used to be called archaea bacteria until the 1990s. Now, 
Our bacteria and archaea are collectively called our prokaryotes because they look very similar, they behave very similar. And our eukarya are our eukaryotes. And again, for the purposes of the course, fungi, algae, and protists. And viruses, again, I'll just mention it, they're off doing their own thing. We got no idea. <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about these two major groups, prokaryote versus eukaryote. Again, prokaryote being archaea and bacteria, and eukaryote being algae, fungi, and protists. Now, just, just to reiterate, our archaea are more closely related to us than they are to the bacterial counterparts, but because bacteria and archaea look similar and behave similar, um, we group them together as prokaryotes. So when we think about the defining characteristics is basically the presence of absence of a nucleus. So prokaryotes lack nuclei and they lack or grain or <laughs> they lack, they lack um, organelles and our eukaryotes have a nucleus and they have organelles. That's the main characteristic difference between a prokaryote and eukaryote. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, that's the key difference here. The presence and the absence of uh, membrane-bound organelles. Um, and there's also some other things here, including uh, endomembranes, including the Golgi, and the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum inside eukaryotes. Um, and these are things that eukaryotes have, but prokaryotes lack. And when we think about the two basic cell types, we have a prokaryote here, and that's in contrast to a eukaryote. Again, prokaryotes are very, very simple. They have some ribosomes, they have DNA, they have a cell wall and some sort of membrane, and that's it. Very, very simple, which um, I think is kind of nice. <laughs> uh, in terms of this course, very, very simple structure, very, very easy to learn how it works. Uh, that's in direct contrast to our eukaryotes, much more complex. The organelles, mitochondria, Golgi, endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus, DNA organized into multiple chromosomes, right? Very much more complex from our prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our, oops, our prokaryotes and eukaryotes also differ in size. So you'll see, if we were doing this in lab, um, you would see these shapes. Uh, you'll still see them, but you'll just see pictures of them instead, unfortunately. Um, eukaryotes have a much greater, are much larger. And so eukaryotes are typically 10 times larger in diameter and over 1,000 times larger in volume than our prokaryotes. Um, and eukaryotes also take some pretty great diversity of shapes and sizes as well, whereas our bacteria and our archaea take a very limited number of shapes and sizes. So um, we can just sort of look at this morphology. So a nuclear membrane, it's, we do not have that in bacteria and archaea, but it's present in our, in our um, eukaryotes. Uh, shapes, our bacteria have a very limited number of shapes. It's typically cocci, rods, or spirochetes, and we'll, you'll see those in your laboratory work, and you'll also see that um, all throughout this course. Um, and that's in contrast to our eukaryotes, which have all sorts of crazy and wacky and wild shapes. And then the average size does vary. So our bacteria are typically um, one to five microns, uh, so one one millionth of a meter to five millionths of a meter. Um, that's the same for our archaea. Our fungi are about 4 to 25 microns, uh, protozoa are about 10 to 50 microns, and algae are about 10 to 50 microns as well. This is in direct contrast to, say, a plant cell, which is typically over 100 microns in size. So very, very different size-wise. So let's talk about some general properties, and we're going to talk about our eukaryotes first. Um, most eukaryotes, I'm sorry, prokaryotes have a thick outer envelope. That's a really important characteristic that all our prokaryotes typically have. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, most prokaryotes have a very thick outer envelope. And you can ask yourself why. Well, um, it's really important. Thick outer membranes are important for keeping outside from inside. And we'll talk about membranes later in this class when we talk about structures, but membranes are important. And that thick outer membrane is an important function, serves an important function in all our prokaryotes. What are some other prokaryotic properties? Well, they're morphologically simple and metabolically complex. As I mentioned uh, earlier in this lecture, any type of, you know, when we think about eukaryotic metabolism, it's all basically one type of, it's sugar and oxygen. But microorganisms, our prokaryotes, do all sorts of crazy different types of metabolisms. Um, our prokaryotes also typically only have one or two chromosomes, and they reproduce asexually by a process called binary fission. Um, how, in terms of sort of uh, sort of splitting apart these bacteria and archaea a little bit more. I mentioned that they're very distinct groups and our archaea are much more closely related to eukaryote than they are our bacteria. So what's the difference between there? 
Well, the big deal here is the cell wall. So bacteria have cell walls made out of peptidoglycan, and we'll discuss this um, later in the lecture, whereas our archaea do not. Um, and one of the sort of interesting fun facts about the cell wall is that many antibiotics that we use, such as penicillin or vancomycin, um, actually target peptidoglycan as a way to kill the bacteria. Um, so this actually functionally makes archaea immune to many antibiotics, including penicillin and vancomycin, which is actually kind of a, a good thing that most archaea actually don't cause infection. We actually don't know any pathogenic archaea at this point. So it's good that they don't actually infect humans because they're immune to so many antibiotics that we use. So fun fact. Um, in addition, um, their flagella is very different. So the structure and what powers it, um, we'll talk, again, we'll talk about that later when we talk about structures of bacteria and archaea as well. And they also have very different cellular membrane lipids. And this is um, sort of uh, the way membranes work. So as you should remember from your very first class, science classes at Roxbury, um, they have a phospholipid bilayer. And this is what that's sort of that general schematic. Um, both archaea and bacteria have proteins spread throughout the membranes. They both have phospholipids. Bacteria do have a bilayer, whereas archaea have a monolayer. And as, what I mean by monolayer is, you know, you see the bacteria have two distinct layers. Well, archaea have their layers linked together. So they have very, very long lipids here. And how these lipids are linked together actually differ. So bacteria are linked by ester um, and archaea are linked by ether bonds. The chemistry band, that's not important. Just know that they do differ. And um, the, there's much more branched lipids in our archaea relative to our bacteria. Um, so that's an important characteristic. Cytoplasmic membranes are very different between bacteria and archaea. And in addition to all these other factors as well. So they are very different, but they do look very, very similar as well. And if you want to sort of look at an archaeolipid here, um, again, it's, it's all combined together from outer inner, whereas uh, they have um, a bacteria just have this bilayer, or archaea have a mono and bilayer sort of working together. Just as a note, they are different. Um, metabolism is also very different. So our archaea have um, a much higher temperature tolerance than our bacteria. So archaea have been shown to grow up to 120 degrees centigrade, which um, if you know anything about about Celsius or centigrade is that's 20 degrees over the boiling point of water. So that would be about 225 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's in contrast to bacteria, which have only been shown to grow up to 90 degrees centigrade. Um, archaea are the only groups of microorganisms that can actually biologically produce methane. And if you pay attention to climate change, uh, methane is a very big greenhouse gas, and this can only be done by a group of archaea called the methanogens. Bacteria simply cannot do that. Um, bacteria are actually only the only microorganisms capable of de degradation of complex carbon polymers. So you're thinking about plant fibers and things like that. Archaea lack that ability as well. And as I mentioned before, bacteria are the only pathogens that we know to date. Though I would not be surprised if someday we find it our archaea that is in fact a pathogen. Um, and this is actually a really nice article about why archaea don't cause pathogenesis if you want to sort of take a dive into the, the microbiology society's uh, sort of thoughts on the matter. It's actually kind of an interesting read if you have about 10 minutes or so. Um, what are some of the ecologic, ecological roles of prokaryotes in general? Well, they're involved in decomposition and cycling of nutrients. They, they're the base of light and non-light based food change. So when you think about, um, you know, every food chain starts with something that's photosynthesizing. And bacteria often are that bottom link in that uh, food chain. They're also the food, the bottom of the food chain in places where there's no, no light. So if you go to the bottom of the ocean where there's no light, the base of the food chain is all bacteria using, um, doing all sorts of crazy metabolisms to produce energy. Um, they also form mutualistic symbionts of many macrobes, which is my favorite way of saying things that are large. This includes humans. And uh, so just to sort of highlight uh, what, what I mean by this sort of nutri this sort of symbiosis, there's a really cool bacteria um, called Buc Bucnera aphidicola, or just Bucnera as a general thing. Um, it's actually a um, bacteria that lives in these little sort of like tendrils coming off this aphid here. I hope you can see that. And what this bacteria does, um, it actually lives there. It's a symbiont of this aphid. And what it does is it actually produces um, amino acids for this organism. So aphids, if you've never heard of one before, they're major agricultural pests. They have these little proboscis that they stick into the, the stem or the leaf of a plant to suck out phloem. Now, phloem is what is a nutrient-rich, sugar-rich um, 
uh, fluid that flows through the 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 the, um, the vascular tissue of plants from the leaves down to the roots. It's very very sugary and rich in um, uh, photosynthetic products, um, but it is very lacking in all sorts of amino acids and essential nutrients. So enter our bacteria Buchnera. It lives inside, forms a symbiosis, and as you can see from this graph, it actually produces tons and tons of essential, non-essential, and essential amino acids for its host. So we're gonna actually revisit this topic later in this, this uh, not this topic, this symbiosis later in the semester. But just to know that these bacteria, um, not just in the aphid, but in you and your dog or your cat, provide a major nutritional symbiosis for everything. So let's, uh, let's move on for our, from our, our prokaryotes and our, our sort of uh, simple guys. Let's talk about the general properties of eukaryotes. Um, so we talked about, you know, the nucleus and membrane bound organelles. What are some other properties? Well, they are morphologically diverse and metabolically simple when you compare them to prokaryotes. Um, that being said, there are some classes of eukaryotes, principally fungi, that can decompose lots of organic compounds. Um, but the way they do it is very simple. The process is by oxidative phosphorylation or, or respiration. Um, they typically have many, many chromosomes, um, you know, upwards of, you know, there's some eukaryotes that have 40 plus chromosomes, but they typically have, you know, three plus chromosomes. Um, to put this in perspective, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the baker's yeast typically has 32 chromosomes. So, um, and there are some amoebas that have 50 plus and with reports in the hundreds. So there's all sorts of crazy things they do. And um, unlike our bacteria, which only do asexual reproduction, eukaryotes can perform sexual reproduction as well. <clears throat> And as I mentioned, these are our major sort of groups that we've talked about. Um, we spent, as I mentioned, we spent more time on the prokaryotes because this is the sort of the main focus when we think about microbiology, of course, but we are gonna talk about these eukaryotes as well. And we're also gonna talk about the viruses um, and uh, sort of uh, later in the semester, we'll talk about the viruses, but let's talk about some major morphology of eukaryotes. So protozoa and algae normally grow as single cells. Fungi also typically grow as single cells or they can be multicellular. So for instance, if you like mushrooms, mushrooms are multicellular fungi. Um, our fungi produce what are called hyphae or mycelium, which are actually large multicellular branches. Um, these are what we call filamentous fungi. Um, these are actually like root-like structures that allow these fungi to grow over a surface. So if you've ever had like a mold in your bathroom and it's spread from a single point, it forms like little, you know, tendrils coming up. Those are hyphae or mycelia. Um, the other, another type of fungi are yeasts. These are single cells that reproduce by budding. Um, these are like, you know, think about what makes beer and bread and wine. That's yeasts. And then we have what are dimorphic fungi. Um, these grow as yeasts and have hyphae. So it's sort of a hybrid between, you know, uh, these uh, filamentous fungi and yeast. And there is a really impressive diversity of shapes and, and sizes and stuff like that. And we can just look at a few. So we have trypanosoma, which is, uh, causes African sleeping sickness, uh, giardia, which causes really nasty diarrhea from um, you know, drinking uh, tainted uh, natural water sources. We have our yeasts, our mushrooms, diatoms and algae. And then we have uh, physarium, which is a slime mold. We'll talk about physarium later in the semester because it's a, it's a really, really fun group of organisms to talk about these slime molds. But you can see there's huge morphological, I'm sorry, morphological diversity in our eukaryotes as well. And in terms of ecological roles, um, they do all sorts of stuff. So protozoa are grazers. They typically um, will consume bacteria. Algae are photosynthesizers. So, you know, they're, they're, they form the basis of food chains. Uh, our fungi are typically decomposers. So they help recycle nutrients. Um, and all three groups contain members that are either mutualistic, so being helpful symbionts or potentially pathogens or parasites. Um, <clears throat> so we can have, ask ourselves a thought question. Um, and, you know, this is something we would, you know, discuss in person, but, you know, we'll just answer it as a class. Um, or I guess I'll answer it for us as a class. Uh, so protists lack rigid cell walls. Instead, they have cytoskeleton. And the question you can ask is why? Um, and um, the question, the answer to this is, is of why is, um, is that they actually move by essentially extending their, their cytoskeleton. So a cell wall is rigid. It doesn't allow you to be flexible. But protists, you have to essentially move by extending and contracting, extending and contracting. Just think about the way a slug moves. It moves its head forth and then drags its body. It moves its head, drags its body. Now, if a protist, which moves like that, 
had a very rigid cell wall, it wouldn't be able to move and then drag, move and then drag. So that's why. Anyways, fun fact. Um, and so we're gonna wrap up this sort of general properties by talking about a viruses. And a viruses are <laughs> a really difficult group to work with. Very, very small, very, very crazy. Um, they are very, very small, much smaller than even bacteria and archaea, and they can't be seen with a normal light microscope. So what we would be using in lab, you would never be able to see a virus, um, at least the vast majority of viruses. Um, they have very, very unique genomes. So typically when we think of a genome, it's all the DNA inside of a given cell. Um, as I mentioned, it's DNA, but viruses can actually use RNA as their genome. So for those of you that have been following COVID, COVID is an RNA virus. Uh, genomes actually don't have to be double-stranded, like pretty much all living prokaryotes or eukaryotes. They can be single-stranded um, as well. And these are not free-living, so they are mutualistic symbionts or pathogens. So viruses are obligate uh, parasites. They rely completely on a host for reproduction and the production of energy to keep them going. And our viruses are best known for causing diseases, including AIDS, hepatitis, polio, influenza, covid any number of really terrible diseases are caused by viruses. And viruses are very, very simple. So they typically take a very limited number of shapes. So we have what are called bacteriophages. And these are types of viruses that only infect bacteria <clears throat> or, or sometimes eukary uh, not eukaryotes, uh, archaea. And then we have our eukaryotic viruses. Um, so bacteriophages are kind of cool. They look like lo lunar landers. I, I, that's the way I always like to describe them. And that's in contrast to our eukaryotic virus, which are typically very simple. They both have the exact same life cycle. And we'll talk about the viral life cycle later in the semester, but it is shared in terms of life cycles between bacteria, phages, and eukaryotic viruses. They enter, they essentially hijack the host, and then they exit the host, killing the host. This is the life cycle all viruses use. And the genomes are um, <clears throat> very, very different. They're small, they're circular, or sometimes they're single-stranded. And again, we'll get into this virus talk when we talk about viruses um, as a whole. So those are our major groups. So let's summarize the second part. There are major groups of microorganisms in that include eukaryotes. And again, the purpose of our eukaryotes is not to talk about plants and, and, and all big things like alligators. We're thinking about algae, protists, and fungi. And in addition to our eukaryotes, we have our prokaryotes, which include our bacteria and our archaea. And then finally, we have our viruses. The microbial groups have very major differences, cellular organization, the structure of the disease, genome, and whether they can or cannot cause disease. Um, there are many different taxa that have very similarities, um, um, including small size and simple construction, as well as symbiosis. Um, eukaryotic microorganisms are very, very morphologically diverse, but metabolically very simple. And then finally, all microbes are metabolically and ecologically very diverse. And I'm just going to take just a quick break because my dog is crying. So just give me two seconds and I'll be back. Okay, so sorry about that. I am back. i to deal with the crying dog. She can go to the bathroom. Um, this will not be the first time that happens when, when you hear one of my recordings. My dogs are very needy. And um, so sometimes I have to break off and go take them outside. So I apologize for that sort of break here. Now, uh, so next up in the final part of our class is gonna be microbial structure and function. So the questions we're gonna to try to answer is, what are the major structural components of microbes and what's the function? What are they made of? And how does it differ between different groups of microorganisms? So when we think about, um, <clears throat> Uh, cell structure and organization. We're, we're going to think mostly about prokaryotes here. Um, if you want to know about eukaryotes, I uh, suggest sort of doing, looking at your intro biology notes from whenever you took it at Roxbury. But when we think about this, we have two main parts. We have the cytoplasm. This is sort of a liquidy-like structure, as you'll see here, in um, that's all purple here. This is uh, contains the, the DNA and what we call a nucleoid. Um, as well as the ribosomes, which are trans, uh, translational machinery. And we'll talk about this next week. Um, well, I guess next class, I should say. Um, and then we also have what we call an envelope. The envelope is just sort of a broad term that includes the cell wall, the cell membrane, cell, me cell membrane as well as the capsule. Um, and the capsule is something that potentially might be present in some microorganisms. Now, we talked about this. Um, we sh I showed you this picture before. We're going to stop at this start at the cell membrane. And you might think, why the heck are we starting at the cell membrane? It's boring. Um, cell membrane is important. Um, it's a sort of an overlooked part of 
of biology. Separating outside from inside is the basic tenet of all life on this planet. So understanding this cellular membrane is going to be our first stop. So again, as I mentioned, it separates out from in. It provides that selective barrier. So it regulates the in and out of molecules, and that's important. Um, as we'll discuss, microorganisms are essentially in homeostasis or in essentially a balance between inside and outside. So that membrane allows them to sort of uh, create um, a much more stronger gradient, which will become important later when we talk about metabolisms. But it's typically comprised of a fossil lipid bilayer. So it's something that is flexible and self-orienting. It's a pretty cool thing. And they also have all sorts of different types of transmembrane proteins. So they provide structure, function, and regulatory um, properties to a membrane. And this is something we'll discuss later. So let's talk about phospholipids. They have three key components, and these are very similar to what you would have inside your own cells. It's slightly different, but essentially, you know, functionally, it's very similar to what they do and how they're oriented. So they have three key components. We have the phosphophoral head, so it's a phosphate head. This is going to be a hydro, a hydrophilic, meaning it loves water. Next up is glycerol, um, and then a fatty acid side chain. And this, these, the, the composition and the orientation of these and how they're bonded to one another um, allows membranes to have different what we call fluidity. And fluidity simply mm -hmm. refers to how things move. And so the interesting property of a phospholipid bilayer, uh, they actually have to physically stay fluid. Um, and they have to stay intact to work. And what do I mean by that? Well, phospholipids are weird. And so when we look at this, this phospholipid bilayer here, we have all these different uh, heads that are, again, these are phosphate heads, they're hydrophilic. Now, sort of interesting, these are in constant motion. And I know that's weird to think about, but they're just constantly cycling around. They're never essentially static. And it's important to think about membrane fluidity because if your membrane is too fluid, it melts. It essentially comes apart, right? It falls apart, your cells do what is called lice, uh, and they break apart. If they're too rigid, it solidifies. So think about butter going from liquid to a solid, right? That's what membrane um, rigidity would be like. Um, and so depending on how fluid your membrane is, it has different properties. Now, there are all sorts of things that affect the fluidity of a membrane. These include temperature, pH, nutrient starvation, and all these things can act to increase or decrease fluidity. So stress is a really big, important way to affect uh, in terms of how a, a membrane functions. But remember, all membranes, unless they're solid and it's solidified, they're always in motion and they're always fluid. And that fluidity allows things to pass through them. So let's talk about phospholipids first. So variation in the number of fatty acid chains alters membrane fluidity. So the more fatty acid chains you have, the more solid or less fluid it is. And what do I mean by that? Well, we can look at two different uh, phospholipids here. We have, um, I'm not going to try to say the name because I'm terrible <laughs> at uh, pronunciation of chemistry terms, but we have a very simple phospholipid here, right? That phosphate group, the glycerol group, and those two fatty acid chains. That's in direct contrast to this phospholipid down here, which has, again, the two phosphate groups linked together and two, I'm sorry, four fatty acid chains here. So this, this phospholipid is far less fluid, has less movement than the one above it. Um, again, that would decrease fluidity. Now, the cool thing about microbes and the cool thing about you as well is you can actually modify your membrane lipids. So you can change this into this to decrease fluidity if it would help you. So if say you were a bacteria and you were living in a very, very hot environment, you could change your lipid from this to this to decrease fluidity, which means you're less likely to essentially come apart at very high temperatures. So all sorts of fun stuff. Next up is um, the variation in the saturation of fatty acids. So we have um, a, a fatty acid up here, so pal uh, palmitic acid. Uh, we have oleic acid and oleic acid, and then um, cyclopropane fatty acid. Now, the cool thing about this is this palmitic acid up here is what we call a saturated fatty acid, meaning that all the carbons here, so each one of these sort of uh, tips here is a carbon, and they're bound to all the other carbons. Now, the cool thing about this is that it's all bound to hydrogen. So the, this is a fatty acid. It's hydrocarbon, so it means all these carbons are bound by two hydrogen. That's what it means to be saturated. Now, when we do unsaturated, what this means is we're adding double bonds, so we're losing hydrogens here. And we can have trans 
fatty acid, or cis fatty acids, just changes the orientation. You see, you, you see this one is straight, this one is kinked. And then we can also have what are called um, cyclic um, fatty acids. So they have like essentially hexagons or triangles sort of embedded in them. And the interesting thing is, is that if you have a, sat, a saturated uh, fatty acid, um, they allow a membrane to essentially become more fluid. If you move down to a unsaturated fatty acid, it becomes less fluid. And then if you move down to these ringed or cyclized fatty acid, it allows for even less fluidity. So you can alter your, the fluidity of these fatty acids by changing the chemistry of them as well. Um, and, it, I'll skip over. and so just to sort of put this uh, as a, in a perspective, we have two fatty acids here. So we have tristerian and oleic acid. And so you can see they have very different structures, right? This one is saturated. This one is unsaturated. This one on the left here is olive oil. This one is butter. But you know just from being in a kitchen that olive oil is liquid and butter is solid. Adding that kink and having no kinks here changes the properties very dramatically. So it might not seem like a lot going from, you know, this to this, right, or this to this. But doing that can do some pretty dramatic things. So the next important part of membranes that we need to talk about are what we call hopanoids. So we have our, again, our fossil lipid layers here. Uh, we, can em we can embed what are called hopanoids. And we'll talk about hopanoids again later in the semester uh, when we talk about the origins of life. But these are, these are molecules that are, uh, they look like this. So they're grained carbon structures. And these can be embedded in the membrane to modify membrane fluidity, rigidity, and permeability. So the more hopanoids you stick in between your phospholipids, the less fluidity you have. Um, so this is actually kind of akin to uh, cholesterol. Um, cholesterol, um, for those of you that have ever seen a chemical structure for it, actually looks very similar to our hopanoids. And cholesterol is something that animals use, um, not plants, but just animals, use to alter membrane fluidity as well. Um, just as also another note about hopanoids, um, they, they're actually absent in archaea, meaning they're only found in our bacteria. Archaea, um, as we mentioned, do some interesting things. Um, and archaea have all sorts of crazy things that will change about their um, cellular membranes. So as we mentioned, our, our bacteria have ester-linked lipids and our archaea have ether-linked lipids. But one of the cool things archaea will do is they'll add sorts of rings into their structure, again, decreasing membrane fluidity. Um, and overall, they will modify their membranes in a very different way because remember they have a monolayer versus which is in contrast to our bacteria which have a bilayer. Now when we're thinking about archaea. Um, bacterial membranes are much more similar to archaea which I think is an interesting thing to think about evolutionary but beyond the, the sort of scopes of this the scope of this course. Um, and our bacteria and archaea again are ester linked and so you know when we think about ester linked, this is what we're looking at here, number six um, in the diagram. This is, this is what it, when we think about ester linked. Um, I don't want to go into the chemistry behind why that's an ester link, but just to know that's, that's what an ester linked looks like. Um, and they have straight unbranching chains of fatty acids, which again here is number five in this thing. Um, but as we mentioned, they can also have kinks as well as we sort of discussed. And these form bilayers, so as we're seeing here. Now, this is in direct contrast to our archaea, which are ether-linked, so number two. Um, you see that they're very different, right? But the presence and the absence of the oxygen here is what matters. Again, beyond the scopes of how much chemistry I'm, I like to talk about, but just to know they're, they're different here. And these have uh, archaea, as you can see in number um, one here. We have their highly branching change of, of saturated fatty acids. And then finally, they form either mono or bilayer. So archaea can form either a bilayer or a monolayer, but the more common way is the monolayer for archaea. And one of the sort of interesting things about the monolayer and the way that the fatty acids differ between bacteria and archaea is this is much more tolerant to heat, so very high heat than this is, which as, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture is one of the reasons why archaea have a much more higher thermal limit than bacteria. So that's our cellular membrane. Next stop on our talk about cell structure is going to be the cell wall. And this is a very distinct structure. So just to sort of think, show you what we're talking about. Um, we have a, uh, in this sort of diagram here, we have our inner cellular membrane and we have an outer cellular membrane. That's what the phospholipid or the monolipid bilayers are. We're going to talk about this sort of layer in the middle here, this cell wall. 
Um, it's an important feature that is present in, in pretty much all bacteria um, and takes sort of two sort of distinct shapes here, um, but it's typically absent in the vast majority of eukaryotes outside of plants and some fungi. So interesting, interesting sort of evolutionary thing again, uh, but again, beyond the point of what we're talking about here. Now, cell walls have some pretty um, important structural components and well as functional components. So they are mostly structural. Um, they're typically more rigid um, and they help withstand pretty high pressures. And the pressures we're thinking about at the cellular level is what we call turgor pressure. And turgor pressure just simply refers to water pressure. So turgor pressure and water pressure are the same thing. Cell walls, cell walls allow um, organisms, in particular microbes, to withstand the pressure of water because water can be a pretty uh, intense thing to sort of survive. Um, they also help, um, you know, well, actually, let me take a step back. The way you sort of think about, um, you know, turgor pressure is like a pressure as a bike tire. So if you ever pumped up a bike tire, you're adding air and air and air to make it more rigid. You can sort of think about a cell wall the same way. You can sort of inflate it to make it more rigid, and, but it still keeps the structure. That's the sort of way to think about a cell wall. Um, when we think about our, our cell walls, so in algae, this is a cell wall comprised of cellulose. Fungi, it's a cell wall of chitin. Diatoms, it's silica, and there's some other types. Um, but again, uh, not all the orc groups we have here have cell walls, and certainly animals don't. Uh, plants have cellulose in their cell wall, just as a, just as a note. Uh, our bacteria have peptidoglycan, uh, and they have gram-negative and gram-positive structures, which we'll talk about here, and we'll talk about in the lab when we talk about the gram state. And then our archaea have pseudopeptidoglycan and glycoproteins. And uh, I always love looking at cell walls of, oops, of our, uh, of our, of our uh, diatoms here, um, but we're not going to talk about them. I just want to show you some pretty pictures of what cell walls look like of diatoms because they form all sorts of cool shapes and structures and all sorts of cool fun things like that. So I just wanted to sort of show you that because what we're going to talk about next is not so exciting and not so pretty. So but let's talk about the bacterial cell wall. So it contains a polymer, which is called peptidoglycan. And this is going to be one of the sort of most important things to um, think about in when, we, when we start sort of doing lab exercises. The cell wall is a really important distinguishing feature that microbiologists use in the lab to distinguish between groups of bacteria. Now, um, so peptidoglycan is a really interesting thing. It's a sugar chain wrapped in circles around the cell. And this is what gives us its glyco name. Now, these sugar chains, as they're, again, they're wrapped around the cell, are linked together by short polymers of amino acids. Um, so we have peptidoglycan, so we have these sugars wrapped around the cells, and they're linked horizontally by these peptide or amino acid cross links. Now, the, the peptidoglycan in a bacterial cell wall, it's consisted of very um, highly cross-linked polysaccharide peptide matrix, or peptidoglycan. Now, the backbone of peptidoglycan consists of alternating NAG and NAM units, and that sounds like just a bunch of <laughs> mumbo jumbo, but uh, NAG stands for N-acetoglucosamine, and NAM stands for N-acetomuramic acid. And this is what it looks like. So we have NAG and NAM, NAG and NAM, NAG and NAM. And remember, they're cross-linked, so vertically, by these these, I'm sorry, these peptide bonds. So NAG and NAM look a little bit like this. So we have NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM. They look very similar, right? They have this uh, carbon group here, ring structure, and um, sort of this little chain here, right? And they're not all that different, right? They differ by this OH, essentially, right? Between here and here. Not a lot that differs. But these all, this is the structure, right? n acetylglucosamine and then acetylmuramic acid, or NAG and NAM. And that's how they alternate on this. And remember, just to sort of go back, um, just to illustrate the point again, they're alternating uh, side by side like this, and they're linked by those peptide bonds. Uh, and this is what peptidoglycan looks like. It's, it's very simple, it's sort of, it's kind of nice, right? Just to sort of look at a chemistry view of this, um, we have NAG and NAM alternating, right? Uh, but remember, they are cross-linked by these peptide bonds as well. And so the interesting thing about a bacterial cell wall is it's actually one single molecule. It's just essentially wrapped around, you know, think about like a really long rope that you wrap around something and then you use like twist ties to, to hold the rope together sort of vertically. Um, and that's basically all it is. 
And so the bacterial cell wall, it's also been called the sacculus because S-A-C-C is sugar. So sac is sugar in science term. Um, and they're interlinked. So it's one long sugar chain. And these links, uh, these uh, peptide links are actually important, important uh, to the host. So if you got rid of these links here, um, the, the peptide glycan layer would simply fall apart. So for instance, um, we think about how um, a host, the host as in say like a human would defend against bacteria. One of the enzymes that we can produce to kill bacteria is an enzyme called lysozyme, which actually can degrade these, um, these peptide links here. And so, um, you know, it's sort of an important, this, these linkages, which again, keep this very long chain together, can actually be an important target for a defensive response inside of the host. But we'll, we'll talk about this later in the semester. Um, that being said, just to show you what lysozyme looks like, you know, essentially we're cutting these linkages here. Um, and that's what lysozyme is doing. It's cutting these, it's essentially unraveling the very long chain of sugars. And under, under a microscope, this is what this looked like. So if you treated something with lysozyme, you cause a hole to eventually um, be produced in the bacterial cell wall, spilling all the contents of the bacteria out of itself. So just a fun fact. Now, the cell wall and composition does vary. So many bacteria differ in the thickness and the location of their peptidoglycan in their cell walls. And this variation is what causes the differential color coloring in, in a procedure that you would do in the lab and you're going to learn about in your lab exercises called the gram stain. And so we have two distinct, oops, I'm sorry about that. We have two distinct groups of bacteria. We have the gram positive bacteria and we have the gram negative bacteria. And so what you can see for both of them, our gram positive and gram negative have a, a cellular membrane. So it's a phospholipid bilayer here. And the, B, the big key characteristic here is between positive and negatives is the presence and the size so the, just simply the size or the thickness of the peptidoglycan layer. So what you notice is that our gram-positive bacteria have a very, very thick layer of peptidoglycan, which is anchored to the cellular membrane, as well as this layer called the S layer, called tachoic acids, and we'll talk about those. Um, that's in contrast to our gram-negative bacteria, which have a very, very thin layer of peptidoglycan, which is not attached to the cellular intercellular membrane, but is instead attached to a second outer cellular membrane by what are called lipoproteins. So two very distinct types of bacteria, the gram positive and the gram negative. And sort of the interesting things about human pathogens, um, they're found both in both of these groups of bacteria. Um, and if, you know, so this is sort of the biggest di di sort of differentiation between two groups, uh, and, and, I'm sorry, different species of bacteria, the presence and the absence of a thick layer of peptidoglycan. Now, let's take, a, let's take a quick tour of uh, the gram-positive cell wall. So again, remember uh, cytoplasmic membrane, uh, peptidoglycan layer anchored by tocoic acids. And these tocoic acids give things, um, give these cells their uh, rigidity as well. It's in direct contrast to our um, gram-negatives. Again, um, inner membrane, outer membrane, no linkages here, very, very thin layer of peptidoglycan. So um, just to give you a nice little summary table, uh, our gram positive have a very thick, not thick layer of, of peptidoglycan up to 25 layers, very, very thin for our uh, gram negative bacteria here. The cell membrane, there's only one in gram positive, two in gram negative, and the membrane associated proteins, there's tocoic acid in our gram positives and our gram negatives have lipopolysaccharide. I'm sorry, I didn't touch on that. Lipopolysaccharide these these, um, um, membrane associated proteins on the outside. Actually kind of a cool thing about lipopolysaccharide is it's actually a uh, fever inducing. So if you get a, a fever from a bacterial infection, it's most commonly from lipopolysaccharide on a gram negative bacteria. Just a fun fact. Now we're going to talk about this in lab, but I figured I'd just make it make mention of it. Um, we, this is how gram staining works. And so this is a technique we would be doing in person in lab, but it said you're going to learn about um, and look at some cool pictures in the virtual lab. But um, we have gram positive and gram negative, very different construction of cell walls. And we can use that different construction of cell walls to differentially stain the, these bacteria. And this is something, again, you'll learn about in lab. So uh, the, the next thing we need to talk about uh, after we sort of just wrapped up this little discussion of the cell wall is the S layer. And the S layer is what we call surface layers. And these are the outermost layers. These are things that actually kind of, interestingly enough, they, they, they self-assemble. 
as I've said here, it's wicked cool and kind of is wicked cool. Um, Self-assembly is a, a really cool thing. And so the idea being if you broke a, an S layer apart uh, and then and just left it, it would reassemble back into an S layer, which, is, which I think, again, is wicked cool. Um, it is widespread in bacteria. It is universal in all your archaea. And this S layer has many functions. So it provides protection, structure. Uh, and this structure is important for archaea, which lack cell walls. Uh, it's also, also important for cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, and it also forms a scaffolding for enzymes and virulence factors. And virulence factors we'll talk about later in the semester, but just to tell you what they are now is they are um, uh, compounds produced by bacteria that help um, essentially then become better pathogens. So if you have virulence factors, it typically means you're a pretty good faction, uh, pathogen, not a faction, pathogen. Um, and the, the interesting thing about these guys is they're actually highly ordered. They have a monolayer crystalline lattice of proteins. And uh, uh, so to just show you what S layers look like between the three different ones. So we have gram positive, gram negative, and archaea here. So you can see the plasma membrane and then the S layer here. We have the plasma membrane and the S layer here and the plasma membrane and S layer here. So they have, they're, again, they're, they're outer layers present across all three major groups that we've sort of discussed thus far in terms of membrane structure, um, but they do have varying different shapes. So just to show you what they look like, this is a electron micrograph. Um, and so you can see they take these really cool crystal-like structures. Um, again, these are all, these are proteins um, forming these really interesting crystal-like structures. But uh, they do vary between um, are different types. So the, the archaea um, and uh, I'm sorry, our bacteria are both gram positive and gram negative, have very similar structures of their S layer proteins, whereas our archaea have very, very different structures. And they're also anchored very differently as well. So the S layer sort of just sort of attaches to gram positive, like, um, like almost sticky like. And that's in contrast to the S layer in, in bacteria, which is linked by um, lipopolysaccharide. Um, gram negative bacteria by lipopolysaccharide. And that's in contrast to our archaea, which actually directly, oops, directly embed themselves in that phospho or the phospho mono or bilayer of our archaea. Um, interesting thing about um, <clears throat> our archaea cell wall, their S layer does consist of proteins or glycoproteins. And um, just to sort of um, give you a sort of a whole picture of, um, oh, I'm so sorry about that between the sort of the differences between our gram positive and gram negatives in our archaea. Um, again, gram positive, very thick layer of peptidoglycan, gram negative, very thin layer. Archaea, either um, sort of this one type of group, which includes methanobacteria, methanosphere, and methanobrevibacteria, or this other group, which includes halobacterium or methanococcus. They have very, very different membrane structures. So again, phospholipids here in bacteria, typically uh, I'm sorry, phospholipid bilayers for our bacteria, and then typically mono, um, uh, mono, mono layers of phospholipids. I don't know why that's so hard to say today. It just is. Um, all have, uh, we have the S layer, um, but it is, it does differ pretty heavily between these. And so um, I hope the difference between bacteria and archaea is pretty stark. I hope that the difference between these two major groups of archaea is pretty stark. And I hope the difference between gram positive and gram negative is also pretty stark as well. And so the sort of last stop in our talk about the, the membrane structure is actually going to be the capsule. And the capsule is a thin covering layer of polysaccharides. So they're typically not proteins, but they can be made of proteins. And capsules are uh, not a very common feature across bacteria, um, but they are found in a couple different groups of microorganisms. Um, but these um, provide many functions. So the, the main one we think about in terms of um, you know, pathogenesis of microorganisms is that the capsules provide um, protection for phagocytic activity. And so think about uh, the way your white blood cells engulf and kill a bacteria. That's phagocytosis. And uh, what the capsule does, it actually gives uh, essentially like a camouflage bacteria. So it basically allows them to evade your immune system. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, as you can see here in this picture, here on the right, they're very, very liquidy looking, which means they contain lots of water, which pre helps prevent drying out of microorganisms. They also exclude viruses and, and, such a, and other toxic chemicals, um, including those that are very hydrophobic, such as detergents. So bacteria that um, have capsules, they, um, 
they're more resistant to things like hand washing than bacteria that lack capsules. And they also um, give, um, uh, they also aid in attachment to solid surfaces. And this helps these bacteria form what are called biofilms. And we'll talk about biofilms a lot later in the semester. In fact, there's a whole lecture dedicated to them. But uh, biofilms are basically like just clumps of bacteria living on a surface. So if you've ever like, uh, you know, like forgot to brush your teeth for a day or had to not brush your teeth for a day because you were doing something, I don't know, whatever, uh, you get that sort of filmy gross layer on your teeth, that's a biofilm. And biofilms are read readily formed by bacteria with capsules. Now, the other final thing I'd like to note is they also give colonies their shiny and wet appearance, and that's what you see here. So. Um, the best known group of bacteria that have these are a group of bacteria called mycobacteria. And the best known group, the best known uh, organism from this group of bacteria is mycobacterium tuberculosis, which as I'm sure you can guess by its species name, causes tuberculosis, which is one of the most deadly diseases in all of human histories. Now, this is what a capsule looks like. So we have our cellular membrane here. We have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. And then we have this layer of mycolic acid, arabinin, and galactic, and this form this basically this type of cell wall that's essentially unique to mycobacteria. And then we have the capsule. And so we have these sugars, we have some phospholipids, and we have these uh, glycolipids here. But a capsule, again, is this mostly sugary layer here. And, and when we're thinking about this technique of the Gram stain, the Gram stain actually doesn't work on bacteria like mycobacterium tuberculosis because of this layer of this capsule. Um, just as a note about tuberculosis, really cool bacteria, very, very slow growing, but very cool group. Um, one of the reasons tuberculosis was really hard to get rid of for a very long time was because of this capsule. Um, it's also still really abundant. It's not, it hasn't gone away. It's still, it's still a huge killer in terms of infectious diseases. So. Um, and these, these differences are actually clinically relevant. And so just as a note, uh, if microorganisms that have a capsid, as I mentioned, um, are very resistant to antibiotics. They're also very resistant to being eaten by your immune system. Now, one of the things that's cool, um, and well, I guess not really cool, but um, cool scientifically speaking, not, not health speaking, but scientifically speaking, is um, this, they form slime layers and biofilms, which make them even more, um, impenetrable to antibiotics and detergents and things like that. So by having this capsule, uh, had the cat or the capsid, you could call it, um, it makes them much more difficult to get rid of in a clinical setting as well. Um, and just to sort of, um, you know, wrap up this lecture, we're going to talk about pathogenic bacterial classification. And so when we think, if you've ever gone to the doctors and, you know, you might have had like a, a UTI or strep throat or, or any number of different things, um, they had to do some tests to identify those bacteria. And these are typically um, morphology based. And so we talked about the gram stain, we talked about, you know, you'll see that in lab more. We talked about these major structural differences. But if you go to the doctor, and you're trying to determine how, what antibiotic to use to treat your infection, well, it's typically morphology based. And um, so our gram, our, um, our pathogenic bacteria typically fall into a couple different types. So we can have um, gram-positive cocci, as well as bacilli and branching bacteria. We have gram-negative cocci, which are bacilli and comma-shaped bacteria. We have spiral-shaped bacteria. So these are called spirochetes. This is where syphilis would fall in. Uh, we have what are called acid-fast bacteria or capsule-containing bacteria or cell wall deficient bacteria. So there are four broad classifications of pathogenic bacteria. I know this figure looks old, but it's still used um, uh, in clinical laboratories all across the planet to identify pathogenic bacteria. Just as a note, I know I like, I like this figure because it looks old, but it is still very, very relevant. Now, um, we can look at sort of this. Um, we have uh, sort of major groups of these. So we have, uh, you know, these are gram positives and there's all different types, cocci, um, squares, chains, all sorts of things. And there's all sorts of clinically relevant types of bacteria, whether it's, you know, Staphylococcus aureus, anthrax, um, Clostridium difficile, uh, or Clostridium perfringes, or Clostridium tetani, um, all sorts of clinically relevant um, gram-positive bacteria. We have lots of clinically relevant gram-negative bacteria, again, all different shapes, um, including gonorrhea, uh, E. coli infections, pneumonia. Uh, uh, I was going to say this one, but I forgot what it is. Um, salmonella, there we go. <laughs> Uh, pseudomonas, uh, cholera, all sorts of nasty gram-negatives. So 
Um, with that, um, just as a note, you know, these, these were to show you that all the things we learned are important for, um, you know, thinking about how bacteria work and how archaea work, but they are important clinically still. And I think that that link between the clinical aspect, which I'm sure most of you are very much interested in, and that structural aspect is something we're going to continue to make throughout the course. Um, so uh, uh, just, just wanted to make note, that wasn't all just to talk about structures and boring biology. There is a meaningful clinical thing here. So the cell envelope is made up of several distinct layers, including the plasma membrane, the cell wall, the S layer, and the capsule. And the cell membranes are important. They're barrier. They protect the bacteria from the outside world. Um, they're typically made up of phospholipids and the fluidity, uh, the, the ability of things to move in and out and the motion of this membrane is important and it's regulated by lipid structure as well as the presence and the absence of hoplinoids. Uh, cell walls are important structural components that are made up of various materials. In bacteria, it's peptidoglycan. Remember, we have two very distinct types of bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative. Gram-positive have very thick layers, gram-negative have very thin layers. And then finally, S layers and capsules add additional structure and barriers. And so this is the first stop in thinking about the structure of our bacteria. We're going to go in much more depth next class thinking about um, all sorts of different other structural aspects of bacteria, how they work, how they function. We're going to get into the nitty gritties of this um, before we sort of expand out and think of much bigger topics. But as I mentioned in the introductory lecture, we start off with the simple, we build upon our knowledge. Once we understand the basics of the bacteria, we go to talk about all the cool things. But we have to stop first at all the not so fun things that bacteria do. But with that, I um, hope you guys have a good rest of your week or whenever you watch this, the good rest of whatever day, you know, week, whatever. And I will see you guys on the next recording. Bye-bye.